So firstly, it's an anti-Semitic trope to say that there's an evolution in the Bible from the nasty God of the Hebrew Bible to the loving, forgiving God of the New Testament. It's anti-Semitic. Secondly, the notion of an evolution is really... So sorry, I see if you're quite, I'm quite worked up about this. I love it, I love Secondly, it. <laughs> Thanks so much for doing this and so so great to finally meet you. I thought a sort of a fun way to start would be with your name. Before we get into God and anatomy, I thought Stavra Kapulu would be interesting because as I watch some of the conversations with you, people are either get your name wrong or are kind of scared to say it. And just as like yeah. a way to start, is it kind of, what's it like to have a name that people always mess up or are just nervous to say? Does it bother you when people do that? Um, It doesn't bother me as much as when... Uh, people misgender me like I often find in writing people assume that you know people that don't know me and, and particularly scholars um who aren't in my field at all uh, even scholars can accidentally just refer to me as he and that just annoys me because obviously being a woman in academia isn't the easiest thing in the world sometimes um but yeah my surname it, I, I guess I don't know any different but but I, it's always you know I, I grew up most of you know in England where a name like Stavrakapulu, you know, even though it's very kind of diverse, multicultural society, um, Stavrakapulu still frightens people. I think just because it's so long, you know, if I was just called Stavros, it, it would be fine. But um, but yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm so used to it now that of people messing it up and I don't mind. Um, but anyways, I just thought it was just interesting that perspective of someone whose name just like brings fear to like anyone who tries to pronounce it. But <laughs> yeah, so obviously you come from a Greek background and, you know, in the lead up to doing this interview and you, you get this a lot, hey, I'm interviewing this biblical scholar, she's an atheist and people are just immediately like eyebrows raised and they're confused about that or like they want to know more about that. So I'm wondering if you could just tell people a little bit about how you came to biblical scholarship and also what you say to people that would say atheists shouldn't be doing this work there's a bias that would inherently seep into their work around this <laughs> there's a bias for atheists to to study the bible as if there isn't a bias for jewish or christian people <laughs> to study the bible i mean it's so weird isn't it because like, you're right like people it's this has followed me around my whole not even my professional career even when i started my my academic studies when i did my first degree and then my my master's and then my doctorate and even doing postdoctoral work, you know, people would say, well, but you're an atheist. Like, why would you be interested in the Bible? And it's like, what, why wouldn't I be interested in the Bible? I mean, this is, this collection of texts has, has shaped so much of our cultural assumptions and preferences and our cultural anxieties. Um, it just seems to me to be like kind of wrong headed to think that an atheist wouldn't be interested in the Bible. I've always been really, really interested in religion just ever since I was a kid. I think because I wasn't religious. I wasn't brought up religious at all. I mean, there were, you know, people in my family were different flavors of Christianity, but but not in a kind of going to church all the time way or kind of the Bible was being read, you know, every day. Um, just, you know, that kind of cultural Christianity that that so many of us grow up with in, in Western societies. Um, but I was always really interested in it. And I think because of my Greek heritage, I loved when I was like really little, I loved all the stories about Greek gods and goddesses. And I, I just remember, you know, just not being able to quite understand why there's all this fuss about Jesus, because it kind of seemed to me like this was completely normal in sort of mythological terms that, you know, here's a guy whose mum was a mortal and whose dad was a god. And, you know, so that what's what, why is he so special? How come like this guy gets all the attention now when some of those great mythological figures from the past had, had sort of disappeared? So that's what got me really into it. And then at school, so like high school, we had to study some bits of the Bible for our, um, you know, as our general kind of courses at school. And and I found the New Testament really fascinating. And when I found out Jesus was Jewish, oh my God, that was like, that blew my mind. <laughs> like as a 12 year old, I was like, what? That was amazing. And then I got to university. Originally, I wanted to study New Testament. Um, when I first went to university, I was really interested in, you know, Jewish Jesus, basically. What what was this, you know, what, were the, what was the history or, the early traditions around this kind of guy and, and his execution and 
how come it was it, it was such a big deal and then as a result of that I obviously discovered the Hebrew Bible so what Jewish um, people call Tanakh what Christian people call the Old Testament and wow I was just like hooked I just thought this was like the most exciting collection of of ancient literature um, mm. and that's how I really got into it but I'm it's about the history and it's about the kind of the just it's almost like time travel you know it's like going hmm. back in time and trying to understand the ways in which these particular ancient societies understood their world and understood yeah. the otherworldly um, and that's what really excites me totally and talking about what the other ancient cultures thought about god and what we think today and how things have changed so much we'll get into that in a second but you know the idea so the bible you know is still the most popular book in the world you know i googled this morning i think maybe five billion bibles exist in the world or have been sold or whatever it was but what the bible is or how it's described really varies if you talk to a christian of course it's a divinely inspired word of god it's perfect you should live, we can live our lives by this book. Others think it's the most, the most evil, it's all irrelevant, it should be just banned from society sort of book. What do you say it is from a historical perspective? What is the Bible? I mean, essentially, the Bible is like an ancient anthology of a very, of very diverse texts. And these texts have come, you know, have been not just kind of crafted um, and composed, but kind of reworked, re edited, reshaped, carefully curated and selected by um, consecutive groups of Yahweh worshippers initially, um, and then, you know, sort of Jesus followers after that, but over, you know, hundreds and hundreds of, of years. And so in that sense, it's an ancient anthology, an ancient collection of texts. But I guess the Bible today is also, you know, it's a, it's a cultural icon, you know, whether we like it or not, it, it matters. It's like, you know, it's like kind of Shakespeare matters um, it, and the Bible matters in, in that sense. So it's a cultural icon, whether you believe it or not. But certainly, it's not it's not the divine uh, word of God. And then I think you'd be you'd be hard pushed, I think, to if you could travel back in time, you'd be hard pushed to find an ancient Jewish or early Christian person who would claim that that their texts were were sort of divine in that kind of sense. They become sacred. They become other or special or holy because they contain the name of Yahweh or they contain certain sorts of divine instructions, but they, they're not the text the, the Bible itself is not that idea that it's somehow immutable or infallible or um, kind of unchangeable. I, I think even ancient people would find that hard to get their head around. See, that's interesting because I was going to ask you like, what is the most misunderstood thing about the Bible today? What do you think when you hear the Bible talked about, when you hear whether even if it's scholars or just the general public, do you think there's something that most people misunderstand about it in like a general sense? Yeah, I think, you know, you often hear you know, people from politicians to celebrities to, you know, your next door neighbor say things like, well, the Bible says, I mean, firstly, the Bible doesn't say anything. It doesn't have a mouth. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't actually speak. But it, also the Bible is massively contradictory. It, it's not a coherent ideolog ideologically. It's not a necessarily a coherent work. There are all sorts of, contradictions in these texts and sort of juxtapositions and because these texts weren't written to be to be coherent they weren't written to be these kinds of authoritative um sacred uh, i guess manuals or rule books they were they come as i said from very diverse often settings and periods of time and and it's just that the authority that they have become imbued with has increased over time and interpretations you know vary massively both in an ancient context and the contemporary context so when it's so when people say oh the bible says a b or c you say well yeah but also there's another text in the bible that that says something different or something contradictory or or you know it has a completely different view so i think that cherry picking of ideas of what the bible says is problematic what what's this is a quick follow up on that what is like one thing in the bible that you can be like here's a verse that says this and then here's another verse that says what are like some of the most your go-to sort of lines for people who say well the bible doesn't contradict itself because i've heard that a thousand times from christians and i used to think that and but what are the go-to lines that, that you have i mean not so much go-to lines but i mean look at the fact that there are in the new testament there are four gospels you know like and they're all kind of they, they don't match. Um, they tell very, they can vary quite a lot in their portrayals of the of the life of Jesus. Say something like, you know, comparing the four Gospels, and they're very interested in the earthly life of Jesus, what, you know, up to his death and then supposed resurrection after. 
someone like Paul, like who's writing, his, his works are the earliest in the New Testament. You know, someone like Paul, he's not at all interested in the earthly life of Jesus. You know, so Paul seems to think that the special thing about Jesus, the kind of, I suppose, divine or otherworldly quality or character of Jesus wasn't inherent in Jesus when he was born. That's what some of the Gospels would tell us. But actually, it was something that happened to him after he dies. Somehow his body was completely transformed. It became pneumatic. It became kind of made of spirit rather than flesh. And so for Paul, that's the point at which Jesus becomes special. That's why he's not interested in the earthly life of Jesus, doesn't talk about it. Whereas I think that's what the Gospels in part were kind of written to to correct was, or I say correct very loosely, you know, with kind of cautionary quotation marks around it. But the Gospels are there to, to fill a gap was through saying, well, how come this person's body when he was executed? Why did that transform? Why did that become immortal? Why did that become divine or heavenly or whatever? So, you know, even the, the texts themselves are very are very comfortable with difference. The book of Job, a Hebrew Bible text, is all about contradiction, I think. It's about that that you can't sort of navigate or explain or look for almost what we would call a logical or rational explanation for divine behavior or divine encounters. God mm. can become demonic. That's exactly how he's presented in, in that text. And so I think, you know, and obviously there are other examples. Yeah. Certain regulations, like, you know, certain animals are are perceived as kind of unproblematic ritually or in terms of sacrifice, whereas another text will say, no, no, that animal is completely problematic or some sexual activities are, are problematic and another text they're not. So, you know, you've got lots of different examples. But I think the very fact that the, these texts are, are so different and diverse, like should help us to kind of think, let's just step back a minute and not impose a blanket interpretation on anything. Yeah. It, just as another a quick question to the idea of you as an, an atheist talking about these things and studying this thing, what percentage of biblical scholars in, in your, in your knowledge is, are atheists? Oh. How rare are you as sort of like the world you bring to this? We're kind of rare. Like there's a few of us, but I don't come across many atheists and certainly not many people who started out as atheists when they first got into biblical studies. I, you know, I do have some friends and colleagues in the field who used to be Jewish, you know, or Christian, um, as in practicing Jewish or practicing Christian, um, and and believers, you know, believe in God, um, but have lost that faith. That's perhaps more common, I think. But in terms of like how many of us atheists get into biblical studies in the first place, I can think of only two or three others wow. internationally. But do, I mean, there may well be more. But but yeah. Do Christian scholars? or even in Jewish scholars of the Bible, do you see them as having sort of blinders on about certain things? Or are you actually impressed? No, okay, you're, you're shaking your head. Do you think, oh, no, no. Um, like, what, and, and how does, that, well, how does that manifest itself? Because I could see myself as a believer, I would come in, like, in a way, like, subconsciously trying to prove things are true, or, like, I would hear maybe something you're saying and be like, well, there's other scholars I can get who would disagree with her, so let me lean into mm. that. So does it affect them? Do you see Christian scholars talking about the Bible? And even though they're brilliant researchers, that their religious ideology does negatively impact their ability to be, you know, objective? Yeah, I'd say particularly for evangelical Christian scholars, you can, um, there, is a, there is a real bias. Now, that's not to say that their scholarship isn't good, their scholarship can be great, but it's, you know, any kind of scholarship, you know, this is about interpretation. You know, there are so few hard and fast facts in my field, like in any, you know, any field like archaeology or the study of ancient history or ancient religions, there are so few knowns, so few certainties. So even the way that we interpret archaeological remains is it, it, highly kind of contentious sometimes. Um, but I would say with, you know, even though an evangelical Christian scholar, for example, can be brilliant, a great philologist, so somebody that studies um, the nature and, and, and relationships between words and their meanings and texts and their languages. And you often find that evangelical scholars like philology because they like to think that if they can decipher this ancient text and they're getting to some kind of divine truth but I think that helps people hide because quite often it means that people doing that kind of close critical textual work don't have to engage with the bigger questions about historicity about ideology about politics and and, and social changes um and so yeah quite often I think some scholars who are also big, big believers and are rather fundamentalist in their own personal confessional perspectives, I think can 
often distort or disregard the opinions of, of other scholars because it doesn't work in their favor. So let's talk about some of the things that they might want to disregard. And, you know, I saw you on this this, this Australian uh, chat show, and it was one of the moments where I was like, I got to speak to, uh, to Francesca. And you were talking about Moses. And you basically said, well, yeah. Moses probably didn't exist. And the, the, the host seemed kind of a little bit stunned. And you could tell it felt like something really controversial to say. And I was like, there's no way that's true. Like, the camp and this is, you know, after I was, you know, quite deconstructing my faith and all that. And then you go in, in your book in God and Anatomy, you kind of say, you know, historically at best consigning Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, and even David and Solomon to the realms of fable and at worst to sheer fantasy. Like mm. is is that talk a little bit about that. You know, are you saying that they didn't probably didn't exist? And if so, how do you know that? Or why what makes you think that? <clears throat> I'm I'm saying that because we just have no evidence and what I mean is it's not just that we don't have inscriptions that have come up you know on ancient texts dug out of the ground that sort of say Abraham was here or Moses was here you know like we just there is no evidence for the texts that talk about these characters the earliest that these these traditions could have been written is much 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 later centuries after the period in, in you know that these texts are describing and so and you're looking at the kind of the socio-economic um material context in which you know the conditions the social conditions for kind of writing these sorts of stories could emerge now some people say oh well, what about oral tradition again oral tradition is impossible to to track how do you how, how do you find proof of oral tradition so there is no strong evidence to support a lot of those traditions in the hebrew bible that talk about origins and ancestors so a lot of the stuff that we find basically in the torah so from Adam to Abraham to Noah to, you know, Moses. Like, there's, there's none of those events, whether it's flood or whether it's a mass exodus from Egypt into Canaan, there's no archaeological evidence for it. Um, and so, you know, we do something like David. We've got one reference to the Bait Davies, the, the House of David, in an 8th century, some scholars said 9th century text, um, an inscription. But even then, it refers to, you know, it, it could it refers to if it does refer to the dynasty of David, doesn't necessarily mean to say that David himself existed. Um, you know, it could be that this we know that there was a royal house later on, certainly by that point, that was referred to as the house of David, because we have, you know, lots of other sorts of um, evidence that would support that kind of socioeconomic uh, setup. But so it's kind of like, what kind of evidence do you want? So is it a question of probability? Yeah, possibly David existed. I think probably not. But Abraham, Moses, Noah, no, absolutely not. These are mythological legendary figures. And here's a question for you, though, because would people of ancient times around the same time Jesus was alive? And I, my next question is, did Jesus exist? Don't I won't spoil <laughs> that yet. But um, presuming he did exist, people around, did they? So you're saying they were probably myths for them in a way, or they wrote about them and like they were part of their stories and amalgamations to tell their kids around the, the campfire or whatever. And we're looking at it now being like, yeah, it's David. They were, this was David they were talking about. You know what I mean? Like, did they believe they were true or use yeah, them as sort, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's an interesting yeah. question. Did the ancient people believe in their myths? Well, what do we mean by that? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Words, did, they, <laughs> did they believe? I mean, I think we have a very different view of both time and history as modern people, and, and particularly when things are written down in, an, in a very authoritative text, it must be true. We know now, I mean, look at all the debates that are going on about, you know, AI and all this kind of stuff. You know, we know not to trust what's written down. Whereas, you know, even 30 years ago, if something was written in a newspaper, you know, a reptile newspaper, you'd, you'd kind of believe it was true. But we know not to trust written sources. But those kinds of questions, I think, are questions um, and assumptions that we, we bring as modern people. Did ancient people believe what was, I mean, they had such a different, I'm not saying they were wholly unlike us. They were very similar to us in all sorts of ways. You know, they could feel the same emotions and passions and pressures that we do, but but they also had a very different view of the world. So did they believe that, say, Abraham existed? Probably, but but that sense of a common ancestor, um, that, that that that's really you know we find that in cultures all over the world do they think but would they have said oh yes abraham was around in you know the early bronze age or the middle bronze age or bronze age? i mean they, they wouldn't have had that kind of sense of time of of almost like time so 
did they believe in these stories? They were probably just as skeptical about some things as, as we would be in the sense, you know, manna falling from heaven. Well, how come that doesn't happen for us We're in the middle of a famine? It's, you know. Right. That would be nice. Yeah. So you're saying basically in the Bible, yes, you see the name written. But outside of that, if you're trying to like triangulate your sources or something, you just don't find much evidence, if at all, for some of these figures outside of just the Bible. That's basically like the gist of it. It's not until we get to around the 9th century BCE and we have um, annals and various texts and inscriptions from the great Mesopotamian empires and the Egyptian empires, but mainly the Mesopotamian, so the, the Assyrians and the Babylonians, that they verify some of the names, for example, of various kings of Israel and Judah. You know, so we know that, okay, King Manasseh, yeah, we know that he was a 7th century king. King Hezekiah, yeah, we know, because these are all ref referenced in Assyrian texts. But yeah, that kind of external co corroborating evidence, we just don't have anything like that prior to, I'd say, some scholars say the 10th century BCE, but we're on much firmer ground when we talk about the 9th century BCE. Okay. And so now we come to the to the main man, Jesus Christ, the guy that got you into it, someone who has inspired me growing up and still I find to be an extremely fascinating individual. Did Jesus Christ exist? Um What's your best some guy uh, where would you put your money? Jesus. Yeah. A guy a guy who knows Jesus. I don't think he would have been called Christos, um, you know, which means Messiah. I don't think that that label would have been used to him at the time. I, I doubt that very much. Um but yeah, some guy on whom you know that we now know as jesus of nazareth probably yeah probably existed um he was probably executed by the romans um that's that's as, that's as much as we've got and we base that on probability because simply because the extent to which given the very short relative very short space of time in between when these paul was writing so say mid 50s um ce then the Gospels, as we know them in the New Testament, were written to so say the late first century, early second century CE. You know, given that period of time when these texts were written, it seems unlike. You know, some people said, "Oh, it's unlikely that somebody would invent this kind of guy, this inspiring what teacher, kind of a rabbi figure, some kind of you know sectarian leader um, who would then kick off in the temple and be executed by the Romans." You know, that kind of seems plausible um so probably yeah but we don't have any but again we don't have any corroborating evidence from the first century bce i'm um, sorry the first century ce outside of the text that we now find in the new testament nothing that's it so you know there's a couple of you know some people say oh josephus makes a reference um there's a lot of that looks like quite a problematic um there's a lot of debate scholarly debate around the reference to this jesus um movement in josephus because it looks like it could be a later insertion into some of those manuscripts. Right. Um, I heard in a, another interview you did where you talked about sort of Jesus being sort of like this minor cult that just happened mm. to do better than all the other minor cults of the time. Are there other people that we know of that were around roughly the same time who were basically making similar claims but just have been long forgotten to history? Is that is that sort yeah. of a fact? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, cool. and and not just not just within a Jewish context, but also within a you know, what we might call a Gentile context. So kind of like in Roman era Egypt, in Roman era Greece, in Roman era Italy, there are all sorts of other kind of miracle workers and inspiring kind of teachers and healers and people that are said to have resurrected from the dead. You know, there are lots of other kind of characters around at the time. And maybe even this John the Baptist guy, perhaps he was originally some kind of imagined to be some kind of um, divine or sort of semi-divine man who you know we find you get little hints in the gospels themselves and then some of the new testament texts that there was a tradition in which you know herod um is worried about you know john the baptist resurrecting from the dead because he was so powerful you know he hasn't beheaded but what if he still comes back from the dead so it was kind of this was a world in which these sorts of things they were still amazing and wonderful and incredible and, and sensational but there were quite a few people that were like going around having all these kind of wild claims made about them. So for, if you were to ask me now and potentially to embarrass myself in front of a scholar like yourself, I would say, well, the reason it took off was it got kind of picked up by the Roman Empire. It became politicized and it spread that way. And that gave it that early seed that allows it to be what it is today, which is I think you'd probably agree. And, you know, it's a phenomena that it's mm. became so big and still is so relevant. Like you said, that's why you studied the Bible and that's why you're fascinated mm. by it. But is that how you'd understand it because the Christian 
part of me that grew up would be like, well, because it was the truth and it was spreading and like, but when you look at it from a cold, cold, hard, poli- like historical facts, is that really what it has to do with just that it became so politicized? I think partly because it became very politicized, but partly because, partly also because it was, um, it was appealing to a quite a broad range of, of people. So particularly the sorts of ideas that we find in, again, the letters of Paul, you know, he's writing primarily, he's not writing primarily to Jewish Jesus believers. He's writing primarily to Gentile um, communities who, some of whom um, have Jewish origins, but some of whom don't. And so I think it's appealing in that sense. Um, it's got more of a mass appeal than, you know, it's not kind of a very insular kind of exclusive cult, if you like. But I think also because writing was, you know, the, the ways in which these stories were being transmitted and circulated, this is the, the invention of the codex. Like, you know, it's what we know as a book. So rather than writing on massive, huge, expensive, very expensive to produce leather, you know, parchment scrolls, you're now writing on, you know, on much easier to transport and transmit um, text, like bits of paper, like a, and that are kind of folded together like a book. So that makes it easier as well. But also, I think, what seems to have been like the, at the kind of heart of a lot of the early Jesus movement teaching is the sense that the end of the world was about to come. And people were like, oh, okay, the end of the world, this is, this is huge. Like the, like the heavenly realm is gonna crash into the earthly realm. This is gonna be it, but, but we are gonna be, but if you believe, if you follow this kind of path, your body is gonna be completely transformed. We're gonna have these immortal everlasting bodies in heaven. And heaven is is going to be, you know, the earth will be no more. We are going to be in heaven forever. And so I think that idea that the, you know, Christ, the early generations of Christians really believed that the world was about to end. They were waiting for it. They were ready for it. That's why Paul, again, spends a lot of time saying, don't bother getting married and having kids because, you know, everything's going to end and we're going to have these immortal bodies. You know, we're not going to have to reproduce in order to keep existing down the generations. We are just going to exist forever in heaven as these immortal kind of beings and i think that's a very attractive and you know frightening but i think that's a very attractive kind of idea Mm. if you think the world is going to end then yes sign up for this because this is the thing that's going to save you right you know it it must it's not surprising of course that you're sort of controversial and like you know piss Mm. a lot of believers off because you're talking about these things and just trying to be honest about what's there um does it it must make sense to you that it's kind of scary to have your whole worldview rocked by historical facts do you think people sort of just avoid reading scholarship like yours or would just deny to their deathbeds the kind of things you're saying because it's kind of scary is that something that you've sort of realized and encountered that the kind of stuff you're talking about is so foundationally shaking and could really alter someone's perception of reality yeah, I mean, I think that partly explains why I get, you know, I get a lot of hate mail um, and some very, you know, a lot of death threats and rape threats and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and like, like by email or do uh, people email are, or, or oh my on God. social media, Jeez. sometimes delivered to my work address, um, you know, mm. but like and I think partly I mean, it's always horrible to, to encounter. Um, but like, I think partly the violence of that response is reflects a fear a real fear that somebody and it's normally that i mean again i'm so sorry but it's normally evangelical christians that send me this stuff but i think the violence of their response to me reflects just how frightened they are by these by these ideas you know they accuse me of blasphemy and all various other things but actually what it's doing it it reflects their deep-seated insecurities about well, what if it's not true? What if what if this is not, you know, the reality? What if my ideas about the world and, and the next life are, are, are not are not real? Um, and, I, and I think, so in, in that sense, I think, yeah, I think people can be frightened. But then there are some evangelical, for example, some evangelical people, like some scholars in my field, who are perfectly able to kind of almost do this kind of double think where, they have their faith and, and, you know, they're very secure in their faith um, and they can still undertake really good, critical, scholarly work that, that does, you know, that, that does perhaps challenge um, their ideas. But I think the whole point of faith is that, from what I understand of it as an outsider, faith isn't about, faith is faith. I mean, the whole, that, the, the word says it, it's about just even if the whole, everything tells you, all the evidence points to something being the opposite. You just believe it nonetheless. And that's what faith is. It's a commitment. Um, and so, you know, those people that find that difficult to do are the ones I think who, who um, 
find it problematic, find me problematic. I want to shift and talk about how this modern way of looking back, I think, has become so problematic. And I think part of that is kind of creating dogma and hard line around sort of the inerrancy of the Bible, for example. And you talk a lot about, you mentioned in, in your book, God Anatomy 2, about how like none of these texts came in their sort of original form. They've been amended, mm. they've been edited. And I think some of that maybe in a, in a progressive way about understanding, always wrestling with the text and sort of changing it. And I remember there was a guy I interviewed on, on this site as well named Rob Bell, who's a Christian. I don't know if you've heard of him. He wrote a book called Love Wins. And when I asked him, what's the Bible? He was like, well, it shows the evolution of man's thinking of God, right? The sort of hate Hateful, angry God leading up into sort of the more, oh. more understanding. And maybe you don't oh. like that, but to me, to me, I, I like that in a way that he's trying to express an idea that we're we're growing in our understanding of like not as a, a primitive sort of like angry God and understanding sort of. But but on that point of like, do you think how did when did we get to a point where people stop realizing that we've been wrestling with these texts and trying to change that? What do you think are the important sort of historical moments that sort of cut off that intellectualism? That, that did, I believe, exist in Christianity. I think, I mean, firstly, yeah. um, well, you didn't I, like I you really, didn't like what Rob Bell said, so why not? Yeah, I really don't like what tell he me, said tell because me. I hear this so often. Because, firstly, it's 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 very anti-Semitic. <laughs> it's caricaturing the God of the Hebrew Bible as somehow this is a bad, primitive, unsophisticated, violent, angry God, where and it implies that this kind of evolution into the new into the New Testament texts where you've got, you know, that's a God who is loving and kind and forgiving. It's bullshit. All of the things that you find, the, the New Testament is essentially all these kind of teachings that Jesus is said to have given and that his various disciples said to have given about the nature of God himself, about um, how you treat other people, about sort of all of the good fluffy stuff is directly recycled from Hebrew Bible texts. You know, Jesus and, and, and the first Christians, if you like, were Jewish. They are simply reworking traditional Jewish teaching and in the Hebrew Bible God is equally forgiving and loving and kind and gentle and tender and intimate um equally in the New Testament it's not just this kind of fluffy forgiving loving God have you read the book of Revelation that is fierce that is about violence and destruction and this is God you know and Jesus himself wielding the sword and mm. cutting down people so so firstly, it's an anti-Semitic trope to say that there's an evolution in the Bible from the nasty God of the Hebrew Bible to the loving, forgiving God of the New Testament. It's anti-Semitic. Secondly, the notion of an evolution is really so sorry. I'll, I'll see if you're quite, I'm quite worried about it. I love it. I love Thirdly, it. The, no, the notion of evolution as well. I just find that, you know, we talk about this. I, I find it really problematic when people assume that ancient that, that societies and civilizations that came before us or are somehow different from our own are somehow unsophisticated or primitive or they there are just there are so there are different ways of being in the world there are people and communities today um traditional indigenous communities for example who have a completely different way of being in the world a completely different way of understanding what is a person um you know what is it to what is the relationship between a person and an animal? You know, are they the same or are they different or do they change? There are different ways of being in the world. And to assume that our own Western inflective perspective is somehow more evolved or more sophisticated, I think it's horrific. It, it does a huge disservice to people of the past or people that just live differently from us. And that's right. why that that's why those uh, that's why that annoys me. <laughs> yeah. Basically. And I hope I didn't mischaracterize what he told me all those years ago. I think I have to double check exactly, but I think you're right. But but in saying it, you're like, you've heard that before. So it's not like I just said that and you riff, like I've never heard that. Oh, and this is my riff. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I think, it. yeah, on the on the idea of of biblical inerrancy and that it's it's literal and you don't change it, you don't touch it was yeah. because you were saying before, like, for example, Genesis one, it blew my mind to learn, like, obviously, it's a Jewish poem. And the way it's written and the way that certain words are used, it's a poem. Mm. It's not supposed to be mm. taken as history. That blew my mind. And the people of the early, you know, biblical days and early Jewish Christians or whatever would have known that, would have never thought this is supposed to be history. This is telling us a deeper meaning. It's a myth mythology. But so, like, I did, that blew my mind, like, you know, in my 30s, right? And thinking I was some educated person. So when did we get to a point, though? What, were the, what was the key historical moment where we kind of stopped understanding what the bible was mm. and just made it all about science and it's fact and this is a guidebook and don't rest don't wrestle with this book really and don't change it 
I think I, I think it's hard to sort of say, you know, was there a particular historical moment? I think there were lots of different episodes along the way that kind of have contributed to that that kind of view within certain circles of Christianity in which you just assume that this is an inerrant text. But one of the earliest is when I think when early Christians, so I'm talking about in the first kind of, say, four centuries of Christianity, when they start to canonize texts, in other words, when, when we start to get the canon, what are what is the list of authoritative texts? And what are those texts that we know? There are so many more gospels circulating, so many more lives of disciples and saints and blah, blah, blah. So many more stories about Jesus as a child and all this kind of stuff that didn't make it into the New Testament. They were deliberately rejected for various reasons. So I think when you kind of get this decision, like, you know, as I said, this was like in the first three to four centuries of Christianity, what te which the texts that are in and which the texts that are out. That's, that's the beginnings of saying, these are legitimate, these are authoritative, and those other stories about Jesus and whoever else are not authoritative. That's when you start to get the you know, language of like, well, these are pseudepigraphal texts, you know, these are not really proper texts. These are kind of apocryphal stories. So that's an early stage, if you like. But we know that these manuscripts, so for example, in the Gospel of John, that very famous, beautiful story about um, the sinful woman, the adulterous woman who was brought to Jesus, and a group of men say, you know, we're told in the Torah that, that a woman like this should be stoned to death. And Jesus says, let she, you know, he who's without sin cast first stone. Mm. I'm really sorry about this noise. Um, oh, I didn't even hear it. Oh, that's hear it. It. It's my cat. Um, yeah, great. So that story about Jesus and the adulterous woman, that doesn't appear in the earliest manuscripts that we have of John. That's a later insertion, you know, possibly put in around 300 and something. So that was circulating later, but but separately, independently of the rest of the this material in the Gospel of John. So that's an example that shows you how fluid these textual traditions were. You know, by, so by like say the sixth century CE, that story is now firmly embedded within the manuscript tradition of the authoritative manuscript version of John's Gospel. But we know that in earlier centuries it wasn't. It's the same thing like with the book of Isaiah. Some of those texts from the from the Dead Sea, so the at Qumran, you, you can see on the Isaiah scroll where things that now, that would later appear as in full text, main text in the book of Isaiah, appear only in the margins on these scrolls. They've been, they're kind of later editions that gradually work their way into being main text later on. So once you get the idea of a canonized collection of texts, texts begin to stabilize, but they were very fluid before that. But I think that's an important point at which you start to say, this text is true and authoritative and that text is not. Does that sort oh, of answer your question? Oh, totally. And I was wondering, because I've heard this, I heard a really brilliant lecture that like by a Christian person that I love, very open-minded, very progressive, maybe like his name's Richard Rohr. Maybe you've heard mm -hmm. of him. He's very popular. And he was talking about the the Bible, the, we're, Christians worship the Bible and that's a problem because yeah. and he, he talked about the enlightenment a little bit, like in, during the enlightenment time. And maybe you can yeah. fact check this. I, maybe this isn't a period that you're super focused on but just the idea of like enlightenment came along we turned to reason we turned to science and christians were watching this being like well what do we have to show is our authoritative thing the written word was very popular then obviously and they said well this is the bible this is our science this is our thing what do you know and can talk about how the enlightenment sort of allowed christians to double down an idea that didn't make sense i think, I think certainly, certainly the enlightenment did, did. Right. and i think the idea that i mean and the enlightenment was drawing on a particular on all sorts of different streams of, of much older Greek philosophical tradition, but it was drawing very much on ideas of rationality and reason um, and process and categorizing things and kind of anatomizing things and sort of classifying. And so I think in that sense, the idea that there is somehow um, right and wrong, truth and falsehood um, became much more established as a kind of scientific, um, reality you know so even if you think about it today i mean look at the way that science is treated now i'm very pro-science so you know i certainly believe in in evolution in that sense and i certainly you know believe that you know um that, that life came to being from some kind of you know incredible stellar big bang or whatever so I, i'm i don't doubt science but what i do notice is that sometimes science is kind of assumed to be its own kind of gospel truth you know can you prove it well, no, we can't prove everything. Of course we can't. And then science is a, is a process of kind of repeating the same experiment over and over and over again to see if you get the result. But it all depends on the questions that you ask. It all depends on the experiment that you perform. So I think that sometimes science 
it's almost become that science has become the untouchable kind of it's the new sort of like <laughs> it's the new icon the new kind of it, if science says it's true then it must be but we know that scientific theories are overturned often and they're and they're reworked but that's the point of science the point is to keep testing theories until they fold or break and then you know to find the new theory that explains that but I do think that yeah that enlightenment from the enlightenment onwards I, I do think we have this sense in which somehow reason and rationality and truth somehow becomes the polar opposite of falsehood and fantasy and story and myth Whereas actually, maybe, maybe, you know, our own realities are somewhere in between. Yeah, fascinating. Um, on the top of your book, God and Anatomy, again, another thing where I was like, how do we not know this? Or how do we not talk about that growing up about, you know, early Christians in, in the, the God of the Bible, you know, very clearly had a physical body which just stands in the face of the idea that Jesus is like the physical representation of God and then mm. God and the Holy Spirit are very not things that you can put in, don't look like us. So talk mm. a little bit about that, like how you came to this, this scholarship on thought that was important to write about and why you think it sort of shocked so many people. Like who, who would have known that it was right there in the text the whole time? I think because, um, you know, I noticed that it's even when I was an undergraduate, I noticed that, uh, you know, I was reading these biblical texts and, there were very clearly references to God's body and God's body parts. You know, we've got references to his feet and his hands and his face and his breath and his nose and his belly. And, you know, and, and yet I noticed that a lot of the, when I was at university, a lot of my lecturers and professors, you know, and I was, you know, these were very serious people. I was at Oxford, but a lot of them, it was almost like, it was like special pleading. Like, you know, this isn't the same way that ancient Greeks believed that their gods, you know, were corporeal beings. You know, yes, ancient Greek gods were often human shaped, but, you know, but but the way that, that Yahweh is portrayed in the Bible isn't quite the same. You know, this is poetic. This is allegory. This is metaphor. And I was like, well, how come it's it's it's, you know, fine to say the ancient Greeks believed that their their gods had human shaped bodies. But it's not fine to say that ancient Yahweh worshippers believed that their deity had a human shaped body. It's the same thing. It's the same stuff. And it's most ancient cultures in this part of the world at that time understood that that deities had human shaped bodies or more importantly that humans had god shaped bodies and so i kind of thought why is there still this kind of special pleading and it's because later judaism and christianity insists on the incorporeality and the immateriality of the god of the bible whereas the bible itself doesn't have that issue that's been those later theological preferences have been retrojected back onto the text by scholars and commentators and interpreters and theologians. And that had become the norm. And people didn't realize that they were viewing these texts with these kind of distorted glasses. So that's why I wanted to write the book to say, look how much fun this is for a star. You know, biblical writers don't really have a problem with God having a body. The point about God having a body and almost what's sensational in the biblical stories themselves isn't that he's got a body, it's that he occasionally allows some people to see it or see parts of it. Um, and that's the key thing, you know, an unseen body is not the same as um, a non-existent body right. when it comes to the divine. So is what you're saying is, or one way to look at it would be, we're seeing the references to, to the feet and the hands and the body and the mm. skin and all these different things. But we were just like, oh, that was a metaphor they were using. And we've just totally yeah. continued to miss it. Is that yeah. fair to say? But why, yeah, but why, why, why do we assume it's a metaphor? We don't assume it's a metaphor when you've got text from, very similar period, a very similar place, using exactly the same language. We wouldn't say, oh, they, they just thought that that was a metaphor. Because in these ancient cultures, these people actually, you know, they created statues and figurines of their gods and goddesses who were human shaped. That, so when they say, you know, I walk, I, I look upon the face of God, what they're referring to is it becomes this kind of ritualized formulaic language, but it's referring to going into a temple or a sanctuary and seeing the cult statue of the deity in front of you. So you know, the very fact that we've got these explicit prohibitions in the Bible saying you shall not make an image of, of the divine kind of suggests that that's exactly what people were doing. Um, so, you know, you only tell people not to do something if they're actually doing it. And so that would have been the kind of historical reality of early Yahweh worship. And even when you get the, you know, even when early Yahweh worship kind of as it kind of moves on and as people become more and more uncomfortable with the idea of actually having a material image of God, the notion that he has a body remains. So even the rabbis, you know, who are writing up until the sixth century CE, they're still, they're even more kind of explicit and comfortable 
and colourful about God's body. They're talking about God walking around the ruins of the temple and weeping and kissing its broken walls and right. wearing a prayer shawl on his head. And I mean, I mean, they're really comfortable with it. What, what I find fascinating about history is like, what's the like, is there like one dude, presumably, who was just like, nah, we're changing that and just happened to be powerful at that time? Because if you're saying everyone believes it, everyone, that's how they conceive. And then all of a sudden there's just this, it just, it just, maybe it's, it's not overnight, but it just ends. And then people just, is it, does it have to no. do with like, is it politics? Is it power that you would say no, the ideas is, like this change? Yeah. But that thing, but I don't think we can even talk about everybody. I mean, all we have are the, the texts and the inscriptions that we found. And those texts and inscriptions usually come from, particularly when it comes to Yahweh worship, relatively high status, elite context. So they're not representative of the views of everybody. So for a really good example, when you read the Bible, you would think that there was only one temple of Yahweh and that was in Jerusalem. And you would think that by the fifth century BCE, um, after the Babylonians have destroyed the Jerusalem temple and then it's rebuilt, that this is the point at which everyone, everybody, all Yahweh worshippers now agree, okay, no more temples here, there and everywhere, there's only one temple, it's Jerusalem, that's the only place you can worship. And yet, at the same time, we have letters, texts written by a community of Yahweh worshippers who had built a temple to Yahweh on the island of Elephantini in the Nile, who are writing letters to the priests in the Jerusalem temple, asking them for support and for money. There's a temple of Yahweh, archaeologically it's there, that probably had cult images in it as well. And yet you would never know that if you had the, if you just had the Bible, you would think that all Yahweh worshippers now were had no images, you could only worship Yahweh in Jerusalem, that was it. But but that's not the case. We know that we know that there was this temple at Elephantini. Later on, there was another temple of Yahweh at Leontopolis. So it's because the Bible has been privileged as the authoritative source in telling us about the realities of the, the religious past, but it's not. The Bible is offers a portrayal of the religious past. It doesn't offer a history of the religious past. And even if it tries to, it's not a reliable history. So it's because of the privileging of the Bible within our own Western intellectual tradition that leads us to kind of discount or not even look for evidence of diversity in ancient mm. Yahweh worship, for example. Interesting. One other thing that I found fascinating in the book was this Asherah, and that God mm. had had a wife. And I thought that's yeah. fascinating that that was in that would have been like deleted by the biblical writers or just not included as as part of it, if I understood what, what you said in the book correctly. But can you just give us give me a little bit on Asherah and maybe this idea of like it being sort of the roots of misogyny a little bit or this idea of God, the father. But what if it was God, the father and we had God's wife and stuff, how that could have changed things if that had sort of stuck around? Yeah, yeah well, well, the, the, the short answer, answer is that we have various inscriptions in Hebrew from the 8th century BCE that referred to Yahweh and his Asherah. And most scholars are agreed that um, this indicates a pairing of Yahweh and Asherah. Now, Asherah is the Hebrew name of a goddess who was known all across the ancient Levant. Um, and she was often the consort of the high god. And it looks like, you know, we have lots of references to Asherah. Over 40 times she's referred to in the Bible, but she's also always referred to very negatively. You know, she's a deviant goddess and her worshippers are terrible, you know, rebellious, idolatrous Israelites. But we're also told in those same references, things like Yahweh says, you shall not put the cult symbol of Asherah next to his altar. You know, we're told about kings of Jerusalem who put a statue of Asherah in the temple of Yahweh in Jerusalem. You know, so they're kind of admitting that, you know, they're saying, oh, this was a terrible thing that our ancestors did. This was really, really bad. This was idolatrous. This was polytheistic. It was awful. But at the same time, they're admitting that Asherah was worshipped in the temple alongside Yahweh in Jerusalem. So most scholars now agree that we should probably consider Asherah to have been Yahweh's wife and consort. And most most deities were high gods were paired up, you know, with a member of the opposite divine opposite sex. But yeah, there's this kind of as monotheism emerges, not a great term, but as monotheism emerges, you know, there's this kind of pantheon reduction and, and Yahweh becomes the only God. And so you have to get rid of all the other gods and goddesses in his retinue. And Asherah is one of those victims. And but God remains very masculine, very male. He remains a father. He even remains a husband. And a lot of that language that's used about Yahweh as a husband or as a father gets kind of transferred to his worshippers. Um, so it's this kind of gender kind of querying as well, that most of the writers um, of the Hebrew Bible text were male and they're writing about men for men. Um, but they cast themselves as the kind of 
as the wives of God, um, which obviously plays a role in later Christianity when the church becomes the bride of Christ. For example. Right. Do you think just the lack of female goddesses that have sort of survived in, in, in Christianity, is that played a part, do you think, in, in sexism and misogyny? And for example, the whole debate about changing the pronouns of God, I don't say that yeah. if they talk about God, I just don't even say he because it's, it's nonsensical to me. Do you think that yeah. whole, you know, the fact that we got rid of the memory of Asher and these other things, is that something to do with patriarchy and misogyny? Is that or is that yeah. kind of hard? To, yeah. No, absolutely. It has played a huge role in it. So you kind of get echoes of goddess worship in early Christian traditions, you know, like Mary, the mother of God, is kind of elevated up to the queen of heaven. But, but you know, she is she is kind of this perfect, perfect, impossibly perfect kind of woman. You know, she is not sexually corrupted. She's a virgin, you know, blah, blah, blah. Or, you know, and the other flip side is the other Mary that you get, who in later Christianity is vilified as a whore and as a prostitute. And and so I think, you know, that that kind of the absence of the idealized female in the divine realm um, or the kind of virginal kind of sanitized version of the idealized female is really problematic and has massively contributed not just to, to patriarchy, but also to misogyny. Um, this kind of fear of women and their bodies and their sexuality and their their personhood. Um, so, yeah, I, I think the world would be a better place if goddesses were still around but that's not to say that the cultures that had goddesses weren't weren't patriarchal they could still be patriarchal but goddesses could also play a very important role in the lives of these of men as well as, as right. women. interesting i just have a few quick wrap-up questions if you don't mind sure. i know no, yeah no, no. so i really i'm fascinated to talk to you just switching gears a little bit about sort of atheism and the way that god is talked about in the public space and i know mm. you're an atheist but you don't necessarily identify with the new atheist and that kind of brand of thinking um i'm wondering so people will listen to what we're talking about and maybe they'll hear my perspective and your perspective is like let's just this is all it's all bullshit who cares about it why are we talking about it why are we dedicating resources to it we have the richard dawkins the sam harrises mm. formerly christopher hitchens they present this sort of militant atheism to try to push the world forward in a way where we don't even need to talk about about the Bible and any kind of debate or, you know, interest that there might have been a God and what is spirituality. What is your take on figures like that who are in the atheist space and want to sort of rid the world of these kind of discussions? I find that I find them really problematic because for, on the one hand, I don't think they understand religion. I mean, I think no matter what, I think religion is, is a part of the human condition. I think it's a part of it because religion ultimately is about having a social relationship with a non-existent or otherworldly kind of being or power. And that's an incredible thing. And that reflects, I think, our capacity for sociality and imagination. You know, we can have relationships with our dead ancestors. You know, we have continuing bonds with them. You know, we still go to our grandmother's graves and lay flowers and talk at the tombstone and all that kind of stuff. That's still a continuing bond. So I think there's something fundamental to being human that, that, that gives rise to religion and religious behaviors and beliefs. So it's not going anywhere. So I think people like that are they, they misunderstand what religion actually is. And religion is obviously terrible in all sorts of ways for all sorts of different people, but it's not going anywhere. And so there is no point in trying to kind of dismiss it and to kind of ridicule it. And not least because, you know, not all religious people are bad, unthinking, stupid people. You know, I know a lot of very deeply wonderful, caring, fantastic, clever people who are also happen to be religious. So for a start, don't ridicule it. Don't take the piss. Don't beat down on people just because they're religious. I can't bear that. I might not agree with you. I might not share your beliefs, but I absolutely respect your right to, to have a relationship with another worldly being or power. But I think the second reason is that when you've got things like, you know, not so long ago, Donald Trump holding up a Bible and kind of insisting that in, and then kind of empowering various conservative evangelical Christians to take away the rights of women to have abortions when you've got you know religion you can't say anything negative about god or christianity for example in certain on certain like american tv stations when you've kind you've got atheists who are being killed in various middle eastern and, and african countries um when you've got people whose sexuality is 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 becomes criminal because of what people say the bible says that in itself means that you need to take religion seriously and you need to need to talk about it. We need to explore it. We need to challenge it and we need to engage 
So those kinds of new atheists, I think, are, are, are problematic because they don't give religion the space that it needs in order to in order for us to kind of challenge it to help make other mm. people's lives better. And on the flip of that real quick, just the idea of the post-modernity debate. So Jordan Peterson, for example, has become this interesting figure doing this huge series on the Bible on YouTube. Mm. I don't know if you see like millions and millions of views and he's just talking about it and all that stuff. But the theory, as I understand it, is that post-modernists are sort of throwing out the bedrock of what made Western modernity the society so great. And part of that is his Judeo-Christian value. So even though he might not be practicing Christian, although maybe that's changed, he still likes the idea of religion being part of the society because he felt it was like a glue and it sort of set the foundations for the Western world, which he sees as like the pinnacle, I presume, of like human uh, development. What about that argument that the Bible and Judeo-Christian values sort of set the tone for the progress that made us the, the rich countries today and the intellectual people of today? What do you make of that argument? Um, I mean, I, it, it's an argument. I mean, I, I certainly, <laughs> I, I certainly, um, I mean, I would agree only to the extent that yes, the Bible as a cultural icon has shaped and continues to shape a lot of the cultural preferences and anxieties that so-called Western societies have. So for that very reason, we need to take it seriously. Whether we like it or not, it, it, it is now a cultural icon. It has shaped much of our world as we understand it. But as for notions, these caricaturing of like Westerns, you know, cultural values, I mean, there's no such thing as Judeo-Christian. That, that's just kind of a false hybrid. You know, there's Jewish or there's Christian. Um, but I, I think, you know, trying to claim some kind of evolutionary model, as I said earlier, um, I think is deeply problematic primarily because it others and marginalizes and renders deviant people that don't fall into those sorts of categories and for that reason i find jordan peterson in all sorts of ways deeply troubling and quite stupid mm. very just as a very very last question we, we I keep calling you an atheist and i think you identify as an atheist but yeah. i also know you're associated with sort of humanist groups as well um, yeah. i don't know if you identify as a humanist but i'm curious about your worldview because the 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 very evangelical Christian, the small minded Christian might say, well, you're an atheist, so you don't you don't care about anything and you're just like, you know, a nihilist or whatever. But what is your if, is there a worldview outside of atheism that you would describe that sort of it gives you hope that makes you excited to be a scholar, to, to have a family and to, to live on this planet? How would you sort of describe that other than just the word atheist? Oh, uh, yeah. Cause, I mean, the word humanist. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm a patron of Humanist UK and. And I share a lot of humanist values, but I mean, humanist values are, so, are, are humanist because they are about ultimately the, the, the social good. What is, you know, doing the right thing, not just because it's good for me, but because it's good for other people. And I would say that essentially what gives me, what makes me excited, I guess, is this huge capacity we have. We are the most highly social species and we cannot thrive or survive or exist without not just cooperation, but really trying to lift other people up and empower and help other people. That's the only thing that's going to get us through anything on a personal level, but also at a community level. Um, and for me, that kind of sense of sociality and personhood extends beyond humans to non-human animals as well. Um, so, yeah, for me, I, I guess it's a kind of an environmental, I suppose, an environmental worldview in which I see us as a part of this planet and we're all kind of coexisting together. And it seems as very clearly evident now with what's going on with the climate emergency that that you know we need to do what we can to to improve the well-being of all life on this planet not just our own because this is the only planet we've got and this is the only life we've got so mm. that's kind of my world view i guess i like that well i'll end it there right on right on the money for an hour and uh it's so great to meet you thank you so much for your time this i've been looking forward to this for a while and i find it fascinating i hope this is the first of many conversations digging into your fascinating work oh thank you so much i really enjoyed it awesome